talks, uh, and, uh, and the problem is that it took me a long time to figure out what I would talk about, and there were quite a lot of things that I wanted to discuss. Um, but the thing that kept coming back to me was this uh, cartoon, which, and this is a still from a cartoon, it's a cartoon from 1953, uh, made by Warner Brothers, it's part of the Merry Melodies series with Daffy Duck, and it's called Duck Amuck. And Duck Amuck, I think, is one of the great works of 20th century art. And I want to talk about it, I want to talk about the plot of Duck Amuck and why I think it's so interesting. One of the great things about it, or one of the things I was genuinely considering doing, is it is about six minutes and 40 seconds long. So I was considering just playing it and then just you know, filling in time, going through the features of my phone or something, playing with ringtones. But I decided not to do that, I'd actually like to talk about it. So this is a, uh, a still from uh, a few minutes in to the, to the animation. I just want to describe what happens. The Duck Amok is a very, um, it's been called, and I think rightly, a, 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 a sort of great example of a kind of postmodernist cartoon. What happens in Duck Amok is that the title uh, the title sequence starts, and what you see is the title of the animation written in fake gothic handwriting on a kind of scroll which is nailed to a piece of wood with a, a kind of knife, a dagger. And so when you see that, you immediately think, oh, we're going to see like a historical, it's going to be one of those like a kind of historical, uh, you know, uh, animations. And it seems that the character in the cartoon also thinks that's what's, what it's going to be because it starts out with Daffy Duck appearing dressed as a musketeer, and he charges through a landscape which is characteristically of that time period. And as he charges along, suddenly he runs out of landscape. And he says, what's going Well, I paraphrase. He says, what's happening? And what happens instead is that the, the, the background then gets filled in with a completely different scene. It gets, becomes a barnyard scene. So he then rushes off, changes, comes back dressed as a farmer, and starts walking along and doing the farmyard scene. He walks along, walks along, and then he runs out of scenery again, and suddenly it's a snow scene, and he's really cold. So he runs off, and he comes back again, and he's dressed as a kind of skier, and he's skiing along. So that sets the tone for what this animation is, which is it's a, it's a cartoon where uh, all of the conventions of the form, all of the conventions of storytelling, are systematically dismantled. I should add that it is very funny. Um, I'm not talking about it in a very solemn way. Um, it feels completely weird. It's like sort of deconstructing um, a joke in a way. It's something um, a bit uh, naff about sitting here telling you b b blow by blow about this amazing cartoon, but I do think it's a phenomenally uh, interesting thing. Um, after that moment where he seems to be in the wrong place, in the wrong story, he's ended up in the wrong cartoons, dressed for the wrong thing, um, he starts to have problems with sound. And so he starts to try and speak, and no sound comes out. So he holds up a sign saying, sound please. And then when he speaks, he speaks not with words, but with screaming. And then with, he tries to play his guitar and it's machine gun fire. Um, so nothing works, nothing sinks. And then he continues to have trouble. He's, uh, suddenly the camera zooms out and he's on a desert island. And he says, not that far away, zoom in. And so it zooms in so far that you see his eyeballs, bloodshot, that fill in the whole of the screen. Soon after that, the film itself seems to go out of sync. So you see the kind of black bars of the film, and you see him twice, and he has an argument with himself. Gradually, he becomes, characteristically, more and more frustrated and angry, and he is this kind of screaming id uh, throughout this, this uh, or gradually as we go through, um, until he ends up looking like this, where his beak and eyes remain, and the rest of it is drawn in to look like a kind of stupid, uh, monster character. What you don't see is on the flag behind him, there's a kind of rebus of a screwball. So there's a picture of a screw and a picture of a baseball. So you know he's a kind of screwball and he walks along talking to himself. 
The, this is a spoiler alert, but I mean, it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a clunky gag anyway, but right at the end, um, he tries to make it end. He says, this thing's got to end and it won't end. And he, it, the black sort of, uh, it sort of seems to close in on him and then he opens it up again. He's having this fight with the conventions of the cartoon. And then it finally does end and the camera pulls back as it were. And you see that the animator all along has been Bugs Bunny, who then says, gee, ain't I a stinker, which is the end of the cartoon. So it's really the story, the characteristic Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck story, which is about um, someone who's always right against someone who's always wrong. And what the animator, Chuck Jones, who directed Duck Amuck, said is, Bugs is who we want to be, Daffy is who we are, which I really like. He also said that what he wanted to do with Duck Amuck was, and it's interesting, is he wanted to stretch the form of the cartoon so that the character could be pushed in lots of different directions, but somehow still remain recognisable as that character. So how much of Daffy Duck can we take away um, and it still be Daffy Duck? Which I thought was really interesting. It actually comes to a particular point, a little bit before this, where the pencil, the giant like god-like pencil of the animator, and it is a sort of, it is a sort of god parable in a way, enters into the frame and erases the whole of him except for his beak and eyes. I always thought that was interesting and kind of slightly haunting and it also then occurred to me um, that 1953, which is the year that Duck Amuck came out, is also the year of one of my favourite works of fine art in America, which was the erased de Kooning drawing by Robert Rauschenberg, where Robert Rauschenberg, who was then a young uh, a young artist living in New York knocked on the door of the most famous artist living in New York, uh, William de Kooning, maybe the most famous, and asked him for a drawing which he could then rub out, that he could erase. And it took a few trips. I mean, it's a bit like fairy tale, that story, because I always think of it as taking three, that rule of threes thing, you know, he had to go back three times. I don't know if that's true. Anyway, maybe on the third occasion, <coughs> with a bottle of whiskey each time, he goes to see de Kooning, and de Kooning says, I'm going to give you a drawing, I agree, I'll let you erase it. And he says, I wanted to give you something I'll miss. Which I thought, I think is the supreme act of artistic generosity. To not only agree to have one of your works of art erased forever, but to choose something that has emotional value. And so he chooses a drawing which is dense with uh, pencil crayon and pencil and I think charcoal and all manner of different you know, if you've seen the Kooning's drawings, you know, they're very worked, they're very dense, you know. And it takes him several months sitting at his desk with an eraser, rubbing out the drawing. Runs out of an eraser, gets another one, keeps rubbing, keeps rubbing. I say that's a supreme act of artistic generosity because I think it is. But I also think it's very interesting in terms of authority. Like, and the sort of authority that de Kooning had and his willingness to allow himself to be effaced, to allow himself to disappear. Which brings me back to Duck and Muck. Because even though Duck and Muck and William de Kooning's, or the erased de Kooning drawing by Rauschenberg, have no kind of cultural kinship, in a way. They have no, they share no cultural space, really. They have their, their own completely separate cultural space. And despite that, I think that there is something that they have in common which is this idea that in order for something to move forward, it also has to disappear. Like it has to be erased or effaced in order to exist, in order to be. I just thought that was kind of somehow intriguing. The other thing that, that um, is really fantastic about Duck Amuck is the script. Now the script is available online it's in its entirety and it's very witty and strange. But when you read it, just as text, it reads, speaking of erasure, it reads just like a Beckett script, just like a Beckett script. If you read through it, it's full of these, this consternation and this cycling, this repetition and the frustration. And he suddenly, because Daffy Duck gets annoyed 
And then he, get, then he says, it's fine, actually, I'm okay, it's all right, I feel okay. It was great, where he says, I feel okay, but and then he looks at himself in the mirror and this is what he looks like. <laughs> it always reminds me of my favourite Beckett, which, and I don't know what year that's from, so it would really be amazing if it was 1953, but it probably isn't, which is Crap's Last Tape, which is where Crap, uh, this old chap, is listening to tapes he makes every year on his birthday. And he listens through to ones when he's younger and you watch him listening uh, and you watch him forget and you watch him remember. And all of that, I think, somehow, in a strange way, cycles through uh, Duck and Muck as well. Six minutes and 40 seconds, and it's so worth your time. I'm not going to play it now because I don't know if we have an internet link. But I think that's 10 minutes. I don't know if I spoke for 10 minutes. It probably was about that. 11. Oh, you see, I can break my own rules. Thanks, everyone.